Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Vanessa Tinker. Uh, I'm a lecturer at Collegium Civitas, and I'm also an analyst on frozen conflicts for the Opportunity Institute of Foreign Affairs. Uh, the Opportunity Institute for Foreign Affairs is organizing their second edition of the three C's uh, and one opportunity conference held this time in Warsaw, 16th to 17th of May of this year. Uh, to prepare for the event, I will be interviewing some of our panelists over the next few months to provide you with a bit uh, more insight about them and what we can anticipate for the upcoming conference. So with me today, I have the privilege of interviewing our first guest, Ramina Filipova, who is the chairperson and co-founder of the Institute for Global Analytics based in Bulgaria. She received her PhD in international relations from the University of Oxford with research interest in international relations of Central and Eastern Europe, with a particular reference to questions of identity, constructivist IR theory, media and disinformation, the authoritarian influence exercised by Russia and China in the region. She is widely published. And her most recent book is the Constructing the Limits of Europe, Identity and Foreign Policy in Poland, Bulgaria, and Russia since 1989. So hello, Romina. Thank you for making time to meet with me. And I'm very excited to hear more about what you're currently working on since last time I saw you at the last opportunity um, conference held in Jelanagora. So I would like to hear a bit more about what you are currently working on in terms of your research. Uh, in particular, I have in mind disinformation, particularly concerning uh, Russia and China. So I would love to hear from you. Hi, Vanessa, and thank you so much for the kind invitation. Uh, indeed, currently uh, we're working on uh, Russian and Chinese media influence in Bulgaria and also the wider Central and East European region. And in that regard, we are conducting uh, research and also organizing capacity building events, lectures at universities, uh, seminars, and also uh, international conferences. In the, uh, our most recently released report is entitled uh, Authoritarians on a Media Offensive in the Midst of War, in which we examine the major continuities and changes in Russian disinformation strategies in Southeast Europe uh, since uh, the beginning of uh, the Kremlin's aggression against Ukraine. And also, we study the extent to which other authoritarian states, including China, Turkey, the Gulf states, and Iran, have amplified Russian messaging in the Balkan region. Mm, wow, that sounds very interesting. I'll have to check out this uh, report. You did say it's available online? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's available okay. on uh, our website. It's a study that we conducted together with our partners, the Konrad Adenauer uh, Foundation, uh, Media Program Southeast Europe, and also the European Council on Foreign Relations. Oh, okay. I will definitely have to read that. Uh, I'm wondering if you can elaborate, though, on just two points out of my own personal curiosity. One is when you say you're holding workshops and you're more or less uh, empowering, really, um, different groups and well, countries on how to overcome this situation of, you know, to tackle disinformation, maybe you can just kind of give us an example. What types of capacity building tools uh, do you help, you know, in, in this situation? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we conducted our first pioneering pioneering initiative with regards to uh, counter disinformation training on the 10th of March. And uh, once again, I invite you and uh, our yes. audience to have a look at our website, which contains uh, highlights of the event. 
Uh, so uh, the event, uh, including a range of international experts focusing on combating uh, disinformation, and each of them provided a training session for a wide array of participants uh, mm -hmm. uh, here in Sofia, including from government and uh, civil society. Uh, so the event consisted of a, a number of uh, core topics, and this was with the aim to provide a comprehensive understanding and also tackling of uh, disinformation challenges. So first of all, we uh, focused on uh, the elaboration and also uh, country-specific implementation of an actionable uh, framework for defense uh, against uh, disinformation, uh, which importantly focused on uh, having a very detailed approach to documenting the mm -hmm. uh, threat, understanding mm -hmm. it first, and then devising various ways for countering it with a, an audience um, specific approach. That is to say, uh, this is an approach which looks at the different vulnerabilities the different segments of the audience, which means that we have to have a very targeted approach as opposed to uh, speaking to the audience in general. Then secondly, we uh, discussed uh, the theme and topic of um, establishing effective strategic communications uh, on the level of government, uh, because this is an area which is still unfortunately underdeveloped uh, mm -hmm. in my country, and we're working to uh, change that. And therefore, we discussed has the major definitions, uh, goals, and actors who should be involved in uh, fostering um, strategic communications and building resilience to disinformation in that respect. Um, um, furthermore, we also um, analyzed and uh, uh, provided a list of the various online tools through which we can um, examine Russian and Chinese um, disinformation, because uh, in addition to, of course, our qualitative take and research of um, uh, disinformation, we can make use of a variety of tools through which uh, we can gain insights into, again, audience uh, impact and engagement um, metrics. And in addition to that, we um, also discussed the topic of building societal and cognitive resilience to uh, mm. disinformation. I think the very concept of resilience is crucial, and mm. that's why we um, detailed the various elements that are included in it and how we can study it in a uh, practical way um, as well. Uh, we focus specifically on the importance of uh, um, uh, cognitive um resilience, which means that uh, uh, the particular elements of a country's mindset are very important uh, in terms of uh, fostering the ability to cope with different uh, challenges. So, for instance, um, if there is a unified understanding of the threat, that helps a lot as opposed to uh, having polarization and different interpretations of what the threat might constitute. Uh, then we also um, discussed the topic of fostering effective crisis communications. Uh, mm -hmm. This is very important because uh, whenever there is a big event or big development, such as the um, eruption of the pandemic, or even more, more recently, uh, the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria, uh, foreign authoritarian state disinformation, but also domestic disinformation is very quick to fill the initial void of lack of information, of uh, insufficient familiarity uh, with what is going on. And so uh, disinformation has a huge uh, capacity to flood the uh, information space uh, with uh, false narratives. And so it is very critical for us to know how to foster crisis communications that are able to uh, quickly respond to this threat. Uh, and this includes, of course, a number of elements, including strategic communications on the level of government and a fast response also uh, fact-checking uh, whereby people can actually have information which is based on evidence. And uh, last but not least, we discussed the uh, phenomenon of wartime propaganda, which has unfortunately become a constant aspect of our um, everyday lives and um, how we should continue to be 
sensitized uh, to its various elements so that it doesn't just become banal, but that we continue to be uh, aware of all the um, atrocities committed by the Russian side and the challenges that go with that in the information space. And I'm just just one further question about that. Um, so are you actually working as well, for example, with um, schools, like with ministries of education? Because I would assume that youth in particular are targets in, in terms of trying to kind of rally kind of this more far right leaning, um, more like kind of pro Russian, uh, you know, ideas. Um, so I would assume that at some level there has to be a, a, a way to intervene um, to provide alternative narratives. So um, it, apart from, you know, working with the government officials, uh, working with different institutes, I'm just curious, do you work also with more civil society organizations uh, as well? Because you talk about this resilience, this um, building and developing this kind of society resilience. So um, I'm just wondering, you know, do you actually do workshops as well with, with them at that level? Absolutely, we do. Uh, we we work in particular with students. So we have okay. an initiative, That's great. Um, which is a lecture series. Um, and they are conducted by the institute and together with uh, guest lecturers hmm. on different topics within the overall framework of uh, tackling Russian. Uh, disinformation and we conduct those lectures at different Bulgarian universities because we really do want to engage uh, yeah. um, different audiences and students with various specializations so they do not have to be students of uh, yeah. uh, journalism and mass communications in particular and so far uh, we have conducted a lecture at the new Bulgarian University with Dr. Andreas Umland uh, and the topic was um, Russian identity policy politics and historical falsifications over the course of the war in Ukraine. Um, this is a crucial topic in general because this yeah. is uh, one of the yeah. Russian uh, lines of uh, supposed justification for its aggression against Ukraine, but also it has a lot of um, local resonance here in Bulgaria because unfortunately society is still very much divided in its assessment of its uh, uh, history and in particular relations with Russia. And so, therefore, on the one hand, the aim of the lecture was to learn about um, uh, Russia's historical falsifications in its current politics and how history shapes politics in a very real way. And it's not just something that we study in this part of the past. Uh, and also, on the other hand, it was uh, our goal to foster discussion among the students about how we can uh, reach a better understanding of history without uh, it becoming the weapon Weaponized, of uh, Russian yeah. propaganda. Mm. The second uh, lecture in our uh, lecture series is coming up. Uh, just next week. It will be on the 21st of March and it will be mm. conducted at the American U University in Bulgaria. Oh. And our guest lecturer will be Matej Maucic okay. of the Central European Institute of Asian Studies. And we're going to discuss the Chinese role and factor in Russia's role against um, Ukraine because this is a topic which matters not only in terms of developments on the battleground in Ukraine as to mm. whether China will supply uh, uh, weapons, but it also uh, matters in a much more general and fundamental way since the uh, Chinese position sh ma shows manifestations in um, international politics and in realignments in how um, uh, international politics uh, is being conducted currently. So uh, we are going to discuss relations between Russia and China, um, but also broader uh, trends in uh, international relations, including the stances of other countries, for example, India, Turkey, developments um, in the Middle East. So again, uh, this is uh, part of our strategy and goal to familiarize uh, students uh, with major trends in international re relations, and in particular connected to the opposition between authoritarian countries mm -hmm. and democracies. Wow, I, it's too bad I can't attend that lecture. Is it going to actually be online? Because <laughs> maybe I will. <laughs> you can. Uh, okay. <laughs> it's going to take place in a hybrid format. 
Fantastic. Okay. Well, you have to send me the details after. Um, so moving on, then it's kind of related to this former question, but in what ways have you seen, if any, uh, the tactics actually of Russia and China in terms of their use of disinformation? You know, I guess in particular, after the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, have you seen any kind of substantial tactical changes we have to say that the major trend in uh, Russian disinformation the strategy is linked to the intensification of okay. the pre-existing patterns uh, that the Russia has usually uh, acted along in order to establish media leverage, and in particular in Southeast Europe. So our most recent study points to four uh, major trends, uh, which are common to all of the countries that we studied in the Balkan region. Uh, so first of all, um, Russia has continued to um, act through informal ways. That is to say, there has been a continuity of this pervasive informality of Russian strategy. So instead of uh, directly owning news outlets in the states of Southeast Europe, uh, Russia actually um, employs opaque local patronage networks, which mm. consists of um, policy makers, uh, business people, also journalists, content creators who maintain ties to pro-Kremlin groups and interests and in turn advance uh, the Kremlin uh, discursive agenda in Bulgaria, but also in other countries of the region. Secondly, Russia has continued to tap into um, different sentiments that are prevalent to various degrees in the countries of Southeast Europe, which predispose sections of populations to view Moscow posi positively as a result of the perception of certain similarities yeah. with Russia and the Russians. And therefore, this ambivalence, which means that um, there is a preference for maintaining good relations with both um, Russia and the West, has conditioned the uh, persistent narrative of so-called neutrality which has become uh, rather popular among uh, publics in Southeast Europe. And this neutrality, meaning that uh, people would not like their countries to take a decisive stance in support of Ukraine, this actually conceals a pro-Russian uh, bias and preferences for maintaining close ties with Moscow. The third major uh, trend which is common to uh, Southeast European countries is related to the fact that Russia has doubled down on the use of social media, um, mm -hmm. but not only Facebook anymore, but also mm -hmm. Telegram and Twitter. And it has also um, started to rely even more on its embassies in order to uh, promote uh, propagandist mm -hmm. messages and to interfere even more aggressively in internal debates. And this is so because uh, the EU has banned the broadcast of Russian-owned media right. channels, which has made it more difficult for Russian messages to enter certain parts of the media scene. So therefore, uh, Russia has now started to use other channels, including mm. doubling down on social media and the uh, reliance on embassies. And fourth, final uh, major trend, which is common to the region, is related to the fact that social uh, social media and also mainstream media in Serbia act as the major um, intra-regional conduit of uh, hmm. Russian information. Oh, wow. uh, this is so because of the mutual intelligibility of the languages, especially in the Western Balkans. And uh, therefore, it is easy for such uh, messages originating from uh, Serbia to penetrate the media spaces of other countries um, in the Western Balkans. Wow. There's so many things I would love to ask you more about this, but I will I will stick to kind of more the the key questions because I don't want to take up too much of your time. And I guess more or less the another question I'd like to ask you, though, is very general. So when did you become actually involved with the Three Seas Initiative? And do you anticipate major changes in the digital area in the Three Seas Initiative in the foreseeable future? 
So first of all, I have to say that um, on a personal level, um, my interest in the three C's concept and its historical practice um, dates back a long time, uh, and it is related to the research I conducted on Polish foreign policy as part of my PhD dissertation. So it all started as an academic interest, uh, but um, as part of my work in the Institute for Global Analytics, I have had the chance to become much more concretely involved in various um, initiatives and projects related to uh, the three C's. Of course, we have had a very fruitful partnership with the three C's. Uh, one opportunity, the Opportunity Institute, which uh, really provides us a way forward for crafting common responses and also building uh, regionally collaborative networks as part of the uh, three C's initiative. Now, when it comes to the digital dimension uh, of the platform, uh, of course, uh, it has to be conceded that um, the lowest number of uh, projects uh, are still conducted within the digital domain. And so uh, projects uh, in that area still trail uh, various initiatives um, in the area of transport and energy. So still only about 14% of all projects in the 3Cs okay. initiative are conducted within the digital um, domain. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I think that there have been some positive uh, developments um, um, that came out of the last uh, summit uh, in Latvia, and in particular, the first of all societal forum took place um, at the last summit, uh, which expressed the intentions to establish uh, uh, digital literacy center uh, as part of the 3Cs initiative and also 3Cs fund to support media and journalists. Wow. So I know that I've taken up a lot of your time and I want to thank you again for agreeing to meet with me today. And I look forward to seeing you, whether it's in person or virtually at the uh, upcoming second edition of the 3Cs and One Opportunity Conference coming up this May. Me so too. have a lovely um, rest of, well, the week, <laughs> weekend, now that it's actually Friday. And thank uh, you, looking forward to, to yeah, to also checking out your report online. I'm, and hopefully I can attend this uh, this lecture because that would be fantastic. It's, a, it's an area that I would like to become more educated in myself. So it would be wonderful to to be included in that. Oh, sure. Uh, I will send you the details. And thank you so much for our conversation. Greetings from Sofia. Excellent. Well, I'll speak to you later. And greetings also from Poland. Speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.